I, all right, so I'm welcoming everyone. Hello, everybody. <laughs> this is the, the men's show, Awakening Catholic Men's Show. Let's roll it. <laughs> Welcome to the Men Show, everybody. <laughs> this is a much debated topic, not because the topic is of any particular debate, because we spent the last half an hour debating whether or not we would have a topic. <laughs> uh, so I don't I, even know what the definition of topic is. Yes, yeah, what is, is a topic? Is a topic. Thing <laughs> that we talk about. What is a thing? Okay, the topic is temperance. Because it was the safest decision. <laughs> but it was the most temperate, you might That's say. That's a failure. You're going to go out on a limb, wanted to be safe. Some people talked about it. We're going to talk about temperance today. So, I, you know, one person who I think would be great to start us off on about saying, what is temperance? But why does temperance matter? Why is temperance? He was in the middle of a question. I was in the middle of a question. Have some respect. Yeah, but what is temperance? Viewers might not know what we're talking about. We'll get there. We'll get there. That's we'll get there. literally, I was just trying to, okay. figur All figuratively, right. actually trying to understand what that definition was. John Mark, temperance. Is this the end of the topic? Wait, you want to start it this way? Okay. <laughs> I think temperance. Let's roll like, it. Start over. <laughs> like, start over. I can do that, but usually not start with the definitions because it's boring. Like, oh, right to Merriam Webster. We well, start you know, I agree with Teresa, and I was hoping that the word temperance wouldn't be used until well into this, That's, but we just went for it. Oh, so. I'm going for it. Sorry. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Well, personally, I've been thinking you've had too much to drink, John Mark. I have. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start with that. <laughs> He's drink. sauced. He's sauced right now. <laughs> one drink. Mm -hmm. So was like three days ago, I think. So <laughs> All right. So when you guys go to, let's say you're going to somebody's house for a party, a get together or whatever. Um, what do you think is like safe number of drinks? I think it depends on the drink. Mm -hmm. And it depends on the person. If you're driving. Well, let's say for, for if you're driving and if you're just for yourself. I can have a single like light beer and essentially feel like I drank a soda or something. But if I have like uh, a shot of whiskey, I won't like feel inebriated, but I'll like, I'll like feel like a little, you know, a little cozy a little inside, some, some. a little some, some, you know, mm -hmm. two shots of whiskey. Okay. Probably hand someone my keys. I feel like, you know, so the, the, the driving question is I feel like that complicates the issue of temperance because mm -hmm. You know, like I just stay away from it completely because I don't know what it is to have a blood alcohol level that's mm -hmm. in, indictable. That's or, a good point. So, yeah. like, that's a scientific issue. I don't, I can't really speak on it. I just try to steer very clear of it. Mm -hmm. But certainly, the, the issue of alcohol in general is that you have a substance that, I mean, it's like anything else. It's it's a good thing, and there's an amount of it that's good. Um, but the purpose of, of it is 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 to enjoy this drink. But at some point, at some amount, there's something floating around here. At some point, at some amount, and I haven't had that amount. Is it my smoke or what? No, there was like a little thing. Just there dead. might be like a little gnat or yeah. something. Yeah. yeah. Um, it becomes an issue of whether you're able to remain, you know, uh, virtuous and intentional and mm. in control of your faculties and all that stuff. Mm. Whether it becomes an impediment to your ability to remain prudent. Got it. Yeah, I think the idea of that, that remaining control, because like one of God's greatest gifts for us, arguably, well, I wouldn't say that, but one of his greatest gifts for us is the, the gift of our freedom and our free will. Mm. And because alcohol is, in, it inhibits your inhibitions or whatever, in some ways it makes you less free because you're more susceptible to your passions. Mm -hmm. So that's why people are more likely to fight or more likely to hook up with somebody or more likely to just do rash that's things. a great point, yeah. And so it's somehow compromising your freedom, mm -hmm. which is one of God's greatest gifts. So I think that's why a lot of times in the scriptures it talks about drunkenness mm -hmm. as a sin, but yet Jesus, you know, multiple, his first miracles, multiplying wine for people. Mm -hmm. So we, we see him drinking alcohol. We see other people <clears throat> drinking alcohol. And we see him giving them more when they giving drink so much more. that they run out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But so. I think there's also, in, in terms of since we started with the definition, there's an important distinction to be made between temperance and abstinence. Because mm -hmm. to be temperate is less about saying no to things and more about saying yes to putting things in their right place and right order. Yeah. Well, it gets back to the, you know, our favorite word now, teleology. You know, the purpose of drinking. Everyone take a drink. You know. Oh, my mouth. If it's a I'm feast day, you have a feast, which means you do 
eat and drink, if that's the way that you celebrate that feast day, in honor of what the feast is for. Mm. But it has to remain uh, contributing to that purpose. Mm. You know, like if you wrestle with alcohol, if someone wrestles with alcohol, then the, uh, the temptation that they have is to flip it, to use that feast as an excuse to drink too much rather than drinking a couple drinks as a, as a means, as an uh, adjuvant, uh, a help toward that celebration. Mm. And if it begins to inhibit or interfere with that celebration because I've given up my faculties now and I'm mm. being an ass, you know, then suddenly it's not being used for its proper purpose. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, and I think there are some people who need to be more careful than others because of the temperament, you know, they've, mm-hmm. uh, there's some people that can't drink at all. There's some people that can't right. drink at all. So the litmus test is being an ass. Right. The, the <laughs> clear, clear line right there. Yeah. Well, here's the thing, though. Temperance doesn't just apply to alcohol. That's Correct. the first example we right. go to. Yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of a lot because of, you know, we all learn about the temperance movement in yeah. hi- American history class. And it's an easy example. Yeah. But temperance as a virtue is a whole way of life for everything, everything. for all of the material goods of this world. Um and really, like, you could apply temperance to the actions that we choose, mm-hmm. that um, it's avoiding an excess. Mm-hmm. Um, when we talk about intemperance, what, so you learn about something by what it's not. Mm-hmm. Intemperance is an excess of anything. So it doesn't have to be alcohol. It can be food. It can be your phone. Mm-hmm. It can be oh, yeah. um Time spent on any one thing. Sleep. You can be intemperate. Yeah, you can be intemperate with video games. They can be apparent good things, you know, if they're done in the wrong way at the wrong time because you desire that thing because you're right. So that's my boy C.S. Lewis talks when he's talking about morality and mere Christianity. He says it's like the notes of a piano, that there's no wrong note on the piano, but there's the right note played at the wrong time or in the wrong circumstance. Yeah. And that's kind of an important way to see. I love that example because it kind of perfectly illustrates the difference between temperance and abstinence because mm-hmm. you are not when you're playing piano, you're not thinking, especially when you really know what you're doing, you're not thinking in terms of, I got to make sure I avoid every one of these notes, except for like these three notes. You're thinking mm-hmm. here are the right three notes for this moment. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's a beautiful illustration of that. I'm really glad you brought that up. And I would say, um, so when you're talking about um, virtue. Um, Aristotle's going to tell you that virtue is the in the middle between mm-hmm. two extremes. Exactly. So intemperance really talks about the extreme of excess, but abstinence would be the extreme of deprivation there. Mm-hmm. And the absence of something doesn't mean the presence of temperance, right? Mm-hmm. So it doesn't mean uh, the fact that I don't have access to alcohol right now doesn't mean that I am temperate with alcohol. Mm. It just means I don't have any right now. Mm. This is right over there. It's right there. (laughs) (laughs) Um, If I don't have uh, a smartphone, that doesn't mean that I have temperance when it comes to technology. It just means I don't have the opportunity to practice that virtue. So So, so how would we distinguish the different, like for someone that knows they have a problem with smartphones. So they say, I'm going to get a dumb phone instead, like, or a feature phone is what they call them. Um, what would be the distinction of like where virtue is kind of being placed there? Like it it, it is virtuous to make that choice. Like I'm going to get this because I know I have a problem here, Mm -hmm. but you're not, you're not displaying the same type of virtue you would if you maintained the smartphone, but you used it well. You're, you're displaying prudence in that, in that case. Prudence is the mother of all virtues. This is a really important point for, for Aquinas and for Peeper, who's the, my guy when it comes to the virtue stuff. Um, we tend to, when we think about, when the modern man thinks of prudence, we tend to think of this kind of this extra virtue, it just means don't be stupid, stupid, or mm-hmm. whatever. It doesn't seem to be significant. Aquinas calls um, prudence the mother of, of all virtue, the virtue bearer. In fact, he insists that all virtue passes by way of prudence. And it's a significant point because what prudence really means is turning to face reality and making decisions accordingly, translating that reality, that truth into decision. And it's significant here because, you know, Prudence then has to govern temperance, has to govern the passions, okay? But if you recognize that something, um, that you're intemperate with something to the point where you can't control it and to be in that situation, you're not going to be able to be temperate. Well, then you have to, it, prudence means I don't put myself in that occasion of sin. I actually have to create some distance. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes people stay in the realm of temperance forever saying, oh, I just got to, uh, next week I'll be more temperate with this thing. When really they need to say, oh, I need a break. I need some space. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things I've heard that lends to that, and you can fact check across the screen. Can you do that? Mm -hmm. Fact check. Fact check. False. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, (laughs) 
that temperance is the crowning cardinal virtue. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's said as the last to be developed or something, mm -hmm. but you may be in a situation unable to be temperate as a Christian, as a man, mm -hmm. as a person, where you need to start off with prudence mm -hmm. and say, I have a dumb phone or yeah. something yeah. like that. So the, the word cardinal virtue comes from the Latin word cardo, which means hinge. So you think of like a door on a hinge. It's what allows the door to open or close. So every, the, the, the cardinal virtues of prudence and temperance and justice and fortitude, sometimes called courage, those are like the building blocks of every other virtue. So if you think of every molecule on the periodic table is made up of protons and electrons and neutrons and different, you know, organizations, every virtue of, you know, uh, Thomas Aquinas talks about chastity as like having I mean, temperance, and, but there's also prudence. And so and modesty or generosity, like those are all built up of different amounts of prudence, temperance, justice, and fortitude. Because as you said, a virtue is the mean between extremes. How do you find that mean except with temperance? How do you achieve that mean except through effort, through fortitude? How do you know what it is if you don't have prudence or justice to show you what that good is? So every virtue is built of these four building blocks. Mm -hmm. okay, and I think people are even in that, in, in one of his books, he says something to the effect of that the virtue, the cardinal virtues are the hinge on which the gate to heaven swings or something like that. Um, I think for the, maybe a saint quote or some, some place in there. I thought I read it. Maybe he was quoting a saint when he, when he wrote it in his book, but I'm pretty in sure I read so that in his. so far as we have anything to do with our own sanctification and justification, which God, you know, he works through us. He, mm -hmm. he invites us to take action, to make decision. Insofar as we have something to do with that, the part we play, mm -hmm all involves the cardinal virtues. Yeah, those are the natural virtues right. that we have by our own natural God-given. They're still God-given, but right. even if you don't have a relationship with God, there's still things that, um, you know... People you have a sense of the importance of those virtues, yeah. Yeah. Um, and you usually notice them in their absence, right? So you don't yeah. have to have any relationship with God to be able to see injustice. Mm -hmm. Right. And yeah, so that means that right. naturally you have an idea of what justice is. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't have to have a relationship with God to tell. Usually we see it better in other people than in ourselves <laughs> um, to tell when someone else is being imprudent or intemperate. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I know a guy that is agnostic um, that for by his own observance of like the people in his life that he has seen have problems, he has made a choice to literally not drink any alcohol ever. Mm -hmm. And he's never, he's not yeah. ever experienced it and felt, oh, I have a problem. He just doesn't ever want to get near it. My brother's like that. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I had some seminarians uh, that were my classmates in Rome from Ireland. And there's sort of a stereotype there, as much as there is here about um, the Irish and about Irish priests especially, and about being drunkards. And in order to sort of like fight that, um, stereotype or to fight that notoriety, mm -hmm. they all decided they weren't going to have anything to do well, with alcohol at all. Mm -hmm. um, out of a sense of, um, I would say that's more prudence than temperance, though, wouldn't yeah. you? Yeah, I, I guess yeah, recognizing the broader situation and making that decision. Mm -hmm. You know, I think to, to to figure out whether it's an issue of temperance specifically, I think you know. It, I think the cardinal virtues, if you if you flip them around and think of them in terms of an examination of conscience, I think there's there's some really powerful stuff there. When we think about temperance, we think about what are those situations that I I, I get in repeatedly where my desire uh, takes me beyond what I what I wish would happen. You know, it takes me out of uh, where I regret. What are the situations I constantly regret because my mm -hmm. desires push me too forward? Or what are those things? that I, I like that when I'm deprived of them, I'm, I'm upset because mm -hmm. then we recognize these, these desires, the desires aren't bad and the things aren't bad, but I have something that needs to be tempered, needs to be ordered, you know? And then, then we, once you've identified those, you can, you can make a better plan for them, prudence, but you can also select things to work on those. You know, I mean, fasting is a great example that we have as Christians. You don't fast from bad things. Fasting from bad things is being just. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't <laughs> sin. Like that, that, you don't fast from bad things. You fast from something good to, to practice temperance, to yeah. practice order. You refrain from bad things. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 It's beautiful. So, something that's hard, I, I think. Well, so there's, there's they're talking about drinking and temperance. I, and we're talking about the mean between extremes and the, the golden the golden virtue, but then there's the, the vice of, of defect of deficiency when you don't when you're not doing something enough, and the the vice of excess where you're doing something too much. With some things, it seems like there isn't a vice of deficiency. Like mm -hmm. I don't think anyone would say there's something wrong with not drinking at all. 
Mm. Right. But it, I think where it's often hard to find temperance is where it's a thing where you're supposed to do it. So I think, um, you know, so if you think about yeah. sex, mm -hmm. like a couple, a healthy couple should have a certain amount of sex. It's probably different to some extent for, for different couples and different times and that sort of thing. But, you know, what are you, how, how do you, how do you, how do you find that, you know, is in maybe openness to children and, mm. and NFP and time of the month, like maybe that has something to do with it. Mm. Uh, maybe previous sexual baggage has something to do with it. Uh, maybe pornography, sexual addiction has something to do with it, but there, it, you can't, that's not just the thing where you can say a married couple can say, Oh, we're just not going to do it. Whereas a married couple can say, Oh, we're just not going to drink. And that would be a fine solution to their drinking problem. If they have sexual issues, it's not just, about how we'll have sex, you know, have a bunch of sex or don't have yeah. any sex. Like there's, so like, I think especially for people with sexual addiction, it's really hard for them because you can just give up no more, no more cocaine, not going to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, as hard as that is, but the sex addict then has to be like, how do I do this thing that I was addicted to and was so unhealthy in, mm -hmm. but in a healthy way? I've wondered about the, the balance thing. I mean, that kind of comes to us from the Greeks. Mm -hmm. And I, I've, I've often wondered if, if, does that, is it somewhat incomplete because they lacked, you know, what, what we believe we have as Christians, which is we do have the ideal. We do know the purpose of our life. We do have that telos, you know, where we're going with it. Whereas what they were just figuring out is as a human being, how do I live rightly on a human level mm -hmm. where, where we actually have a supernatural end that we attach that to. Yeah, that's true. And I've wondered about that with some of those issues that there doesn't really seem to be a clear golden mean. Now on some of those issues, I would say though, like there are some things that again, look, you were bringing up these earlier things that look like temperance that just aren't mm -hmm. like someone who, you know, despises like okay, we have one person who might like food too much and they tend to overeat. We have, might have another person that just sort of has a, what do you say? A manichaeanism, a, a, uh, Hey, they, like, they, like they just kind of despise the material world. Mm -hmm. I'm just kind of above that. I'm, I'm too spiritual for such things. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a certain defect in that as well. Like there's a certain, mm -hmm. certain inhumanity, a certain coldness to that. And there can be a vanity in that too. And, which if I would say the vanity of that sort is an intemperance, again, I just want to exactly. a passion, a desire exactly. to be looked at or thought of a certain way. So temperance is just not a limiting thing no. necessarily. Mm -hmm. It's also calling you in some sense to some things. Is yeah. that what you're saying? Yeah. Cause there's it's a positive quality to temperance. Totally. Mm -hmm. That's actually exactly what my point was in drawing the distinction between temperance and abstinence is like, it really isn't about just saying no to something. It's about saying yes to things rightly ordered in the right, right amount. Right. So. Yeah. What you said before is also true that with some of these things there, we wouldn't say that there's anything vicious in abstaining either. Mm -hmm. Um, so it is sort of a tricky thing with mm -hmm. temperance. Um, because when you're abstaining from something, I wouldn't say that you're being uh, temperance doesn't even come in come into play. You perhaps. could abstain for the wrong reasons, perhaps. Like, what if you fast from something specifically to get people to watch me? Matthew mm. six, you know, right? yeah. When yeah. you fast, don't right. let people know or why what, you're fasting. What if you abstain from sex from sex to uh, punish your partner, Ooh. like passive aggressively? Yeah. Like that would be a real vice of, of a sort. Absolutely, where you're using your own body, mm. uh, you know, just as much as someone else may use your body. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, Kierkegaard, uh, he had this, uh, it was the name of one of his books, Purity of Heart is to Will One Thing, mm. was the title of the book. And I, I think purity of heart is connected a lot to temperance here. You know, we temper different desires and passions not to abolish them and not because they're bad, not because the things we desire are bad, but because we want our hearts to be, we want our hearts to be detached to a degree, to a healthy degree from those things. So our hearts can be reattached to what they ought to be attached to. And like we want, if our heart is divided fiercely amongst, amongst lots of things that I desire and I love, I can't be attached to God in the way that I ought to be attached to him. So there's the, there's the negative of, I need to maybe back off from these things, temper those desires, fast a little bit, get kind of get those desires under control, those horses to use the mm -hmm. Greek image. But then there's the positive quality of now my heart is more available and I need to give it, I need to attach it to the right things. Yeah, and we can use abstinence to grow in temperance. Like, you know, the, the, uh, the cardinal virtues are ultimately like their habits that mm -hmm. become nature. Yeah. Yeah. So St. Ignatius of Loyola, when he's describing holy detachment, 
um, it's it's sort of like his own brand of temperance, maybe. Hmm. Um, his first principle is that the things of this earth are created um, to help man get to heaven. And insofar as any created thing helps me achieve that goal, um, I'm paraphrasing, I embrace it and welcome it. And really, I have a duty to embrace it and welcome it. And insofar as the created thing hinders me from achieving that goal, um, I must reject it. Mm -hmm. um, and that looks a little bit different for every person. Yeah. And that's where the prudence and the temperance sort of comes in. But that's that idea of detachment that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. That's really good. And I think that actually that's, that's another point that we, I don't know if we've talked about yet, but um, like with justice, justice is a more objective virtue. It's, it's about relationships out there that we can all kind of evaluate a bit more objectively. But temperance is highly individual, right? Because your desires are different from my desires. Mm -hmm. You know, there are, yeah. you know, there are things that I have difficulty with temperance with that, that you don't have any trouble with that and vice versa. Right. Well, and they're very dependent on, I mean, we started the whole thing with drinking too. And yeah. what is too much for you to drink is not too much for me to drink. Right. Um, Do you know that? Just because. <laughs> the, I mean, I'm a, we could. All right, we're we going to put it to the test. We're going to test it. Is that what we're going to do? Right now. I don't think that's very temperate. Very temperate. Very temperate. Very prudent. All right. <laughs> So how do we apply this to our lives? Like, why does it matter? Well, I, I was just going to say, like, what you said about habits mm -hmm. is is one thing to know that you have a problem of doing something too much or doing something not enough or in the wrong way, but it's quite another thing to actually make a plan to put it into practice. Um, so there's two there's two things that well one um, so Aristotle talks about he calls it the bent stick remedy. So if you imagine like you have a stick or a paper clip and it's bent one way. If you, you want it to be straight, but if you just bend it straight, it's got like some springiness and mm -hmm. it goes back. So you kind of got to like bend it almost past a little bit. So for someone who is, had, has, has been intemperate, they've been doing something too much. So if you've been mm -hmm. spending too much time uh, on your phone or playing video games or something like that to get to the point where you are temperate, it's going to seem like you are really cutting back. It might right? hurt a little bit. Yeah, you, you might hurt a little bit. You have to kind of overcompensate. Or so you know, say somebody who um, has, a, has a problem with opening themselves up with intimacy, conversation uh, with their spouse or something like that. To get to the point where they're, they're at like a healthy place mm -hmm. of openness and intimacy, it's going to seem like they are just being like they're bearing their souls. Mm -hmm. It's going to seem super scary, like they're being overly vulnerable, uh, unreasonably vulnerable. Um, so that's that's the Aristotle um, approach. There's a more modern approach and I forget the book and I forget the that guy's name. It's called like the power of habit yeah. or something like that. Yeah. Um, and anyway, he has, he has, he has a bunch of different, uh, uh, techniques for kind of how to, how to, how to build a good habit and how to break a, an old habit. And he says, you, you, you got to replace, you can't just get rid of a habit. You got to replace it with a better one. Yeah. So. And, that, and that's exactly what, actually what I was thinking at that point is that, so we might, focus on the negative side in the sense of like we're pulling this back, this desire that's a little bit out of control, a bit disordered. But then we, we ought to find ways to, I don't know, arouse, inflame our desires for what we ought to desire more. You know, so how do we, how do we get ourselves like, you know, reinvigorated about our faith, you know, or if, or, if, or maybe, you know, like my desires for food or drink or whatever, you know, take away from my, my real relationships, like with my spouse, or my friends, well, maybe I need to find ways to reinvigorate those relationships. So I'm, I'm detaching a little bit from one and attaching more strongly to another. And so there's a bit of a replacement of, you know, of a bad habit with maybe a better one there. Atomic habits is the name. Oh of yeah, yeah. Atomic yeah. habits. It's really good. <laughs> so, uh, let's say I, I'm hearing some of these ideas for the first time and, um, I, in my life, recognize that there are things, like there's something that isn't sitting right about the way I'm living my life. There, maybe I'm spending too much time, you know, use the example of video games or... Can you give us a practical example from your own life? <laughs> no. <laughs> He's not shaving his back. <laughs> yeah, that's been a real problem. Um, but let's say I'm hearing some of these ideas for the first time, like, it, it's going to be hard to be very, very objective and say, like, I... Mm -hmm. I, I not only does something not feel right, but to go to that next step and acknowledge, like, I have a problem in this area. Mm -hmm. um, and it's different than something like, for example, pornography or whatever, that is like an obvious thing. Like, 
that's obviously a problem. But like, like you know, what we mentioned that you know, uh, intemperance can take the form, uh, or we can observe it even in the over execution or the disordered application of, of good things. Um, you know, spending too much time doing good things can can be a distraction from your family or from work or whatever it is uh, from your spirituality. So how do we take that step to being objective and like seeing that in our lives? So I've been on a Dave Ramsey kick lately. (laughs) Amazing. And when he's talking about finances, he frequently says um, adults make a plan and stick to it and children do whatever feels good. Ooh. And so fire fire, when it comes to finances, but really all sorts of places. Everything. Really, it's a virtue based approach. It's everything. But I think when you're looking at those areas of your life where you're experiencing, where you're noticing a lack of temperance, that's the key Mm -hmm. is that you have to realize right now what I'm doing is just what feels good. Yeah. But my higher powers need to govern that. I need to make a plan and stick to that. So um, to throw out another example, one of the greatest uh, vehicles of intemperance in our time is uh, Netflix or Hulu or whatever you want. Right. So um, TV shows, entertainment, not in <laughs> intrinsically bad. However, now we've got the binge culture, right? Yeah. Because all and 24, this is normal now. All twenty four episodes are going to come out this weekend, <laughs> and if you don't have them watched by Sunday, someone's going to spoil something for you, and it's all over. <laughs> yeah. So we have to binge in forty eight hours <laughs> while going whatever. to mass, right? So you know, just watch it from mass. Yeah. Yeah. Just, watch it. just watch it from home. <laughs> right. So and and that's what feels good. You get into uh, some show, and you're like, well, I start to care about these characters. It's yeah. really good plot right. or it's a lot whatever it is that attracts you to it mm-hmm. um, and then it feels good just to watch the next one and it's available so we do it mm-hmm. um, my phone is always in my pocket I can always take it out and Facebook the scroll never f- finishes and Twitter the scroll never finishes there's always more available to us mm-hmm. um, and so when we notice those things in our life where we're overindulging we have to come up with a plan Mm -hmm. and then practice sticking to it. Yes. And so we say, you know, I'm not going to binge the whole series this weekend. I'm going to do like the old fashioned style back in the day. And I'm going to watch like one episode a week. And actually there is, there is a a trend towards that now, even like HBO max is kind of leading the way in that there, when they're releasing new seasons of stuff, you get one episode a week. Disney plus too. Disney plus is also doing that. Yeah. So we're starting to remember when that happened, like the Mandalorian was all the thing. Oh yeah. We have to wait a whole week. It's funny you say that, that adults make a plan. Children do whatever feels right. My my cousin has a, a philosophy. He loves video games and he says in life there's two, types of people there's button mashers and move doers and, mm. <laughs> and it makes me think sure, of yeah. it's like yeah. button mashers they do whatever feels good then there's move doers and it like explains so much about life um what it's i true. what i was thinking for um how we build good habits and, and and temperance achieve temperance and how do we even know is i think um having other people around that we can trust spiritual mm-hmm. advisors spiritual mentors confession um you know, brothers that lift us up, our, our wives. That's huge. So yeah. I, I can give an example from my own life. So I don't think I realized until I was married how much I thrive off of verbal affirmation. Like if you ever talk about the five love languages, yeah. man, do I love when people tell me that I am doing good, that I am looking good, that I'm doing good, good, looking good, sound oh, great. Man, I, I just what. feel like this high right now. Thank <laughs> you so much. Um, but my wife, like that is not her love language. Her love language is quality time being right with me. So like she will rarely say, I love you. It's gotten better, but like almost every day she'd be like, when are you coming home? Cause she wants me right there. You know, mm-hmm. she just wants to be around me all the time. And I kind of had to learn that. But one of the things that I, I, that through our conversations, I realized that like, I'm probably intemperate with my desire for verbal affirmation. Mm. Like if I give a talk or I do a musical performance or after this podcast, like I want somebody to, and somebody doesn't come up to me and say, Hey, you did a really good job. Like I'm, I'm hurting for that. And maybe even sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll bring up like, Oh, this part, you know, I think it went really well. Like I'm searching yeah. for stuff. And so that's been a huge, uh, thing of growth for me. And it's because I have a relationship with my wife where we have good communication and I trust her opinion of me, um, where I was even able to recognize that I was doing that, where I was trying to, to get that verbal affirmation in an impotent temperate way. So interesting. So I've been wanting to kind of throw in on the, on these, you know, concepts of, you know, making a plan and kind of just going along with life. Uh, for me, it's just 
ties in a lot of concepts um, I've heard or read about before. Uh, one of them was a book by Yif Schumacher, uh, and I'm sure he's not the first person to say it, uh, but he goes and breaks down the world into the different categories of minimal, mineral, vegetable, anim, animal, and rational. And he says, one of the things we do when we, we live our lives on this thing called autopilot is we're operating out of our, our animal level, you know, our, what is our, our base desires. Yeah. And we're not operating, operating out of our rational selves, you know, yeah. our will, our minds, our ability to choose our free will, what makes us distinctly human mm -hmm. and is tied to the animal, um, which I think is, it very much goes hand in hand with prudence, yeah. with making a plan. Yeah. Um, and there was another thing I had heard before too, from Fulton Sheen and Fulton Sheen. Was it anyway? That's a person. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not sure. What it was. Uh, but uh, basically, he he called sin when their lower nature dominates a higher nature. Mm. So we allow, you know, the things we want to do and our desires mm. to power our lives. You know, how how many times do you guys get in the car and you're just like, oh, I'm driving to work. I'm not thinking about it. Oh, I'm at work. Oh, I'm going into work. Yep. I'm doing my emails. I'm doing my thing. Like how often in our lives we don't stop. You know, we connect with God, mm -hmm. we reflect on reality, what's before us, mm -hmm. and we're able to be in a position where we can choose with our higher nature, where we can order mm -hmm. our lives to the way we've been created. And that and that choice and actually the habit of, of activating that higher nature and living out of that, again, that's this virtue of prudence. And this goes back, I think, to your question, Nick, that you, you brought up to, to make this real practical. It's like, especially if you haven't been living that way and you begin to get the inkling that I need to make a change, well, there again, there was a there's a reason why Aquinas structured. He, he explored the virtues in a very specific way. Prudence is at the top, then justice, and then these two, the temperance and courage. Because again, if you, there's there's a problem, you have to refer back to this habit of being that we call prudence. You know, this habit of going. It, it, we have the this word in our parlance nowadays being woke, mm -hmm. and it's all kinds of baggage. You know, and but there's there's a sense in which being prudent is going through life woke mm. instead of going through life just on autopilot it's awake awake yeah we'll, we'll say truly that. woke, woke. Truly like, woke. Awake Super woke. catholic maybe Ooh. But, but that, awoken like, catholic woken <laughs> catholic <laughs> but that too is a habit you know and and um and another aspect of prudence too that involves especially again if you're coming at this newly is that a, a, an important piece of prudence is turning to face reality Whereas beforehand, you might have been going through life really trying to not look reality dead on mm. because it's uncomfortable, because it, yeah. it's mm -hmm. challenging. I don't have a problem. I can stop anytime. Yeah, I'm yeah. good. Rather than turning and facing that fully. And one of the, the reasons I think that having people in your life that, that hold you accountable, that, to have be around virtuous people, yeah. is precisely to have that mirror, to see in them ideals, but also see in their eyes when you're acting stupid or whatever like that. It gives you an insight into reality that maybe you were avoiding beforehand. That's awesome. Yeah, community is so important. All right. Any final words, gentlemen? Nitwit, blubber, <laughs> oddmit, tweak. Remind me to never ask that again. <laughs> All right. This has been The Men's Show. Thank you so much for tuning in, ladies, if you're with us, and gentlemen. Um, if you uh, enjoyed this, make sure to check out our past episodes. Uh, we've talked about some really cool stuff up to now, and there's more stuff coming down the pike, so um, subscribe at awakencatholic.org. And if you want to help be a part of what makes all this possible, um, then feel free to check out the Awaken Nation. It's a group of people that, whether on a recurring basis or a one-time gift, um, make this uh, financially possible, uh, help us keep the lights on in this ministry. Uh, so you can check that out at awakencatholic.org slash donate. Uh, additionally, if you uh, would like to support Awaken Catholic, but also want to enhance your prayer and meditation life, check out the Hallow app. It's an incredible resource that I use every single day. And you can get one month of a free trial of this, of the premium subscription subscription through our website, awakencatholic.org. Um, and yeah. So thank you so much for joining us. Don't binge watch them. these. Don't binge these. Watch them temperately. <laughs> Definitely binge these, in though. five minutes at a time. <laughs> get, get, donate to Awaken Catholic in temperately. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right. Call. This show and all media on Awaken Catholic is made possible by the Awaken Nation and the Hollow app. The Awaken Nation is a community of people like you who support all things Awaken for as cheap as a cup of coffee a week and get access to exclusive content. 
Learn more by visiting awakencatholic.org slash donate. Palo is the only audio guided Catholic prayer app focused on contemplative prayer and traditional Catholic meditation such as Lexio Divina, Daily Examine, and the Rosary. We here at Awaken all use Hollow every day and love it. To learn more or give it a try, visit hollow.app slash awaken.